Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is the type of video game that makes me not want to play video games anymore. Rebirth is a complete and utter chore to finish, filled with tedious gameplay mechanics and uninspired world design that was outdated 10 years ago. Really? You've got us climbing radio towers like it's Far Cry 3? Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? On top of this, Square Enix once again rewrote significant portions of the original FF7 plot, and many of these changes represent a severe downgrade in dramatic storytelling. And yet, nearly everyone is glazing Rebirth. I see tons of reviews calling it a masterpiece, a 10 out of 10, and a luck for Game of the Year. I guess all it takes are fancy graphics and nice music to impress most people these days. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is not a masterpiece, not even close, and in this video, we're going to break down everything that's wrong with this game. We're going to explore major issues with the combat, minigames, open world design, side quests, and of course, the story. There will be spoilers in the story sections of this video, so keep that in mind if you haven't finished the game yet. Without further ado, let's buckle up, grab some iced coffee, and dive into my critique of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Before I dive into everything I hate about FF7 Rebirth, let's start with the positives. The graphics look amazing, the voice actors did an incredible job bringing some of my favorite characters to life, and the music slaps once again. Square Enix certainly nailed the presentation aspects of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. They just failed when it comes to gameplay and storytelling, which are far more important for a video game. Fuck man, they really did pull me in with the nostalgia. I don't think I would have been able to finish this game if it weren't for my pre-existing attachment to the characters and story of the original. Aside from the characters and presentation, the combat is the strongest part of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. When I made my long-form critique of FF7 Remake back in 2020, combat was one of the main things that I praised. But at that point in time, I hadn't experienced many of the trend-setting action combat games. I hadn't played Dark Souls, Dragon's Dogma, Monster Hunter, and obviously newer releases like Elden Ring, Ghost of Tsushima, and Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, because they hadn't been released yet. Now that I have played more games in this genre, I gotta say, the combat in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is mid-tier at best. Compared to the best action games, Rebirth is a tedious slog. For starters, the enemies have way too much health and armor. Defeating enemies in Rebirth is a chore, not because they are difficult, but because it just takes forever. This is true both for trash mobs and bosses. Many of the boss fights in this game take upwards of 10 minutes solely because their HP bars are bigger than Tifa's assets. By comparison, my successful run against Melania, one of the hardest bosses in Elden Ring, took me 4 minutes. And that fight has two phases. I wouldn't mind longer boss fights if the combat mechanics were more engaging. Grand Blue Fantasy Relink has tanky bosses, but the combat abilities, team synergies, and boss movesets are so much more exhilarating to deal with. FF7 Rebirth is mostly just a battle of attrition. Auto attacking until you build up your ATB meter, hitting them with whatever magic they are weak against, waiting until your most powerful abilities come off cooldown, and block spamming. It gets boring very fast. The CC and stun locking in this game is crazy too. There are many occasions where taking one hit leads you to getting wombo comboed into like three more attacks before you can regain control of your character. Now I can sense someone out there is typing an angry comment right now, but Dan, FF7 Rebirth isn't an action game. It's a tactical strategy game too. And sure, you have the tactical pause menu, but the strategy ain't that deep, bro. Most of your strategy will revolve around building your ATB meter so you can use abilities, select whatever abilities or magic the enemy is weak against, and swapping characters to cheese enemy aggro. It's still mostly an action game with a few tactical elements bolted onto it. At this point, I think FF7 Rebirth would have been more fun as a turn-based game because as it stands, it doesn't excel in either strategy or action. If I want to play an action game, I would rather pick up Elden Ring or Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. If I'm in the mood for tactical, then I would rather play Dragon Age or Baldur's Gate 3. FF7 Rebirth melds the two genres together, but doesn't do either of them well. If you like the combat in FF7 Rebirth, more power to ya. There is enough depth here that I can see how someone would find it engaging, 
but I don't think it stacks up well when compared to other titans in the action game genre. Anyhow, now that I've rambled on for combat long enough, let's move on to the newest addition to the FF7 reboot series, The Open World. I play a lot of open world games. I'm a bit of an open world game junkie, and I have to say, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has exceeded in creating one of the most uninteresting, boring worlds I have ever had the misfortune of exploring. You'll partake in riveting activities such as scanning rocks, scanning more rocks, climbing radio towers, Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? Killing mobs, digging up crafting blueprints with your chocobo, looting all the chests in a location, and scanning rocks. You will scan a lot of rocks in this game. If Starfield got a ton of criticism for creating lackluster open world content, then FF7 Rebirth deserves just as much criticism. Because this content is hot garbage. It's worse than a Ubisoft game. I mean, they really put radio towers in the game like 10 years after Far Cry got memed on for the exact same thing. Say what you will about Ubisoft games, at least they create puzzles and moderately fun gameplay activities to fill up their open world maps. I had fun with Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Valhalla, and I wouldn't say either of those games are like a gold standard for open world content. Not even close but it's a hell of a lot better than Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Just off the top of my head, some open world games with better side activities are Ghost of Tsushima, Horizon Forbidden West, GTA V, Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 4. I mean, literally any open world game has better content than Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. The open world content in Rebirth is technically optional, but skipping out on it will hurt your progression. You need to complete at least some activities to develop new materia, most notably summon materia. In the original game, you would find summon materia throughout the main story, but now you have to scan rocks and complete combat simulation trials to unlock them. You could easily spend over 30 hours doing open world bullshit in Rebirth, and from the standpoint of having fun, none of it is worth your time. It adds absolutely nothing of value to the game, and only serves to pad out the length of the experience. Speaking of which, let's talk about the padding. The original Final Fantasy VII was roughly 30 to 40 hours, depending on how much exploration and level grinding you did. But since Square Enix decided to reboot the series as a trilogy that will easily total over 100 hours, they've had to add a lot of new content to stretch out the runtime. Now I will say that the padding in Rebirth is not nearly as bad as the 2020 remake, which stretched the first five hours of the original game into over 30 hours, but padding is still an issue in part two. Most missions in this game take three to four times as long as they did in the original, with certain gameplay sections added in as pure filler. Some great examples are the Yuffie rope swinging chapter in Mount Coral, the Kate Sith portion of Shinra Manor, and pretty much the entirety of Gongaga, considering that town was like a 20 minute footnote in the original game. I mean, they literally have you repeat the dungeon section of that chapter, first as Cloud, then as Tifa. This is flagrant levels of padding, dude. It's blatantly obvious what they are doing here, stretching out each chapter for as long as humanly possible to make a full length game out of roughly 15 hours of original content. Now that isn't inherently bad if they were actually adding something fun and substantive to the experience, but a lot of these filler gameplay sections are mind-numbingly boring. The Kate Sith dungeon section was by far one of the worst parts of the game as you have to do these stupid box throwing puzzles and a bunch of solo fights with Kate Sith who feels like absolute dog shit to fight with. Another section that unnecessarily padded out the game is the end of chapter 10 when you meet with the Gi. This whole plot arc wasn't present in the original game and it adds nothing this time around. It literally never comes up again that the Gi are trying to get the Black Materia. Maybe it'll come back in part 3, but it's completely superfluous to the story. The padding in this game is even more frustrating when you consider that they also cut content that was in the original. Not only was the entire Rocket Town chapter cut, but Sid and Vincent aren't available as playable characters in Rebirth, even though we could recruit both of them before the end of Disc 1 in the original. Now I will admit that the plot arc in Rocket 
Rocket Town was one of the dumbest in the entire game in the original. The idea that Shinra would need to borrow the tiny Bronco from Sid was completely ludicrous. I would have been okay if they rewrote this part, but I didn't want to see Rocket Town yeeted out of the game entirely. At the end of the day, I think breaking up the remake into multiple games was a huge mistake. It f***s up the pacing of the story and makes it so they have to pad out each entry to justify a full-length game and a $70 price tag. But financially speaking, this was probably the right choice for Square Enix. But anyhow, this padding also includes a copious amount of new side quests. Generally speaking, side quests are some of my favorite content in RPGs. I love exploring interesting stories and fun gameplay, especially if there's some kind of choice involved. Final Fantasy VII Remake had some of the most lackluster fetch and kill quests for its side content. So did Square Enix learn any lessons and improve the quests this time around? Nope, no shot, brother. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has, hands down, some of the worst side quests I have ever played in an RPG. There are 36 side quests in this game, and the vast majority are simple fetch quests with extra steps. No narrative choices, no interesting gameplay, no substance, just slop. Sure, the quests might lack substantive narrative or choices, but is the gameplay fun at least? No, it's not. Square Enix seems to excel at designing the most brain-dead, tedious, and anti-fun gameplay scenarios humanly possible. Things like using a vacuum to sweep up Mako, dragging a cord to plug in a generator, guiding black-robed men as they slowly shamble towards an objective, and dragging a can of bird feed on the ground to lure chickens into a pen. That last quest almost threw me into an existential crisis. I've only got one life on this planet, and I'm sitting here in my mid-30s, manipulating a can attached to a string to try and lure some digital chickens for this old bitch. Maybe I should have just gone to law school after all. Does anyone actually derive enjoyment from these activities? If this is what video games are becoming, then I don't want to play video games anymore, dude. This shit is awful. The only thing this game is good at is wasting your time. Coming into Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, I already knew the story was going to be very different from the original. Part 1 already made that abundantly clear with its introduction of a multiverse plot. Having multiple timelines helps the writers justify any differences, which I'm not thrilled about to be honest. But I tried my best to approach things with an open mind. I'll be real, not everything about this story is bad. Even some of the new content was pretty compelling at times. For instance, I like how the Wu-Tai War was integrated more seamlessly into the main plot this time around. I also kinda liked exploring the alternate timelines with Zack, mostly because I just like Zack. Many parts of this game adhered closely to the original plot, at least in broad strokes, and these chapters were usually quite well done in my opinion. I enjoyed the opening chapter of the game, Red 13's Journey in Cosmo Canyon, and the date night at the Gold Saucer. But the bad parts in Rebirth are really f bad. Like laughing and cringing and ain't no way bro kinda bad. I don't want to recap everything from the story, but rather focus on some of the most significant changes, especially the parts related to Dine's story, the insane Gongaga chapter, and of course, the ending. One of my biggest gripes with Final Fantasy VII Remake was that the writers sanitized some of the darker moments in the original game. Things like the Sector 7 plate collapse and the death of most of Avalanche. So I was really concerned with how they would handle the story of Dine. And go figure, they f***ed it up. The worst part is they got it like 95% right, but that 5% they changed completely ruined this plot arc and totally changed the underlying themes of the story. To quickly recap, Dine and Barrett came from a coal mining town called Coral. At the urging of Barrett, the townsfolk cut a deal with Shinra to build a Mako reactor near their settlement. Since the town was struggling, Barrett hoped that making a deal with Shinra would give them enough money to improve their lives. But Shinra betrayed them instead, and intact the town shortly after the reactor was built. In the ensuing skirmish, Dine fell into a ravine, and Barrett caught him just before he fell to his death. But before he could pull him back up to solid ground, Shinra soldiers rained down a hail of bullets on their arms, causing Barrett to lose his grip, and Dine to fall into the ravine, presumably to his death. 
The significance of Dine's story is that it shows the different paths we can walk after losing everything. Dine and Barrett were similar in many ways, literally down to getting guns grafted onto the arms they lost. But the two men took completely different actions in the aftermath of the attack on Coral. Barrett channeled his hatred of Shinra into political action, forming Avalanche and taking out reactors in Midgar. He also channeled his energy into raising Dine's daughter, Marlene, one of the bright spots in Barrett's life that kept him going. Dine, on the other hand, became consumed by bitterness and nihilism. He became a mass shooter, killing random people at a casino to get back at the world for everything he lost. Dine's grief at the loss of his wife and daughter festered into a growing hatred for everything and everyone, including himself. This hatred was so intense that when Barrett informed him that his daughter Marlene had survived, his first suggestion was that he should eliminate her so that she could join her mother in the afterlife. Of course, this dialogue is cut from Rebirth. Dine challenges Barrett to a 1v1 fight, and you even manage to knock some sense into him. In the aftermath, Dine realizes he can never face his own daughter after what he's become. A hateful, cold-blooded killer. A monster. And this specific part was actually represented really well in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Look at me, Barrett. You think I want Marlene to see what her father's become? Stop. With all this goddamn blood on my hands, how could I ever hold my daughter again? Unfortunately, they did not stick the landing on the next part. In the original FF7, after Barrett defeats Dine, the latter man comes to a painful realization. I didn't just lose an arm back then, I lost something irreplaceable. That thing was his humanity. Stripped of everything he ever loved or cared about, Dine became a nihilistic, homicidal maniac. And realizing that he could never hold his daughter again after all the horrible things he had done, Dine decides to take his own life. So what happens in Rebirth? A random group of Shinra soldiers come in out of nowhere and take Dine out in a hail of gunfire. Not only is this comically bad writing, it also changes the core meaning behind Dine's final choice. Dine chose to end it all because he couldn't live with the pain of the monster he had become. He couldn't bear the thought that his daughter would see what he had become. Having a random group of soldiers kill him instead robs him of that decision. There are only two plausible explanations for such a ludicrous plot change. One, the writers on this project are hacks. Or two, they didn't want to show a self-deletion in this game because for some reason suicide is far more taboo than murder in today's culture. So basically a form of self-censorship. One final change to the writing that also changes the overarching theme of this segment is Dine's final words to Barrett. In the original, Dine tosses his late wife's pendant to Barrett and tells him to pass it along to Marlene. The last thing he says to Barrett before he dies is, don't you ever make Marlene cry. But in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Dine holds on to that bitterness and tells Barrett to feel guilty forever. You carry that guilt, that weight. Dine. So rather than passing along a parting gift to Barrett and telling him to take care of his daughter, Dine basically spites Barrett permanently. It kind of reminds me of that dream sequence from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia where Mac tells the gang with his dying breath, I don't forgive you. I swear to God, man, the writers at Square Enix just love f***ing this game up. And nowhere is that more apparent than Gone Gaga. In the original Final Fantasy VII, Gongaga was a quick stopover before a more significant plotline at Cosmo Canyon. You show up into town, visit the reactor, have a quick fight with Reno and Rude, and a scene with Scarlet before departing. It takes like 20 minutes to get through this part of the game. Yet, in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, this section of the plot is padded out to over two hours in length. And the new content that's added in this chapter is horrendous. After spending some time exploring the town, Cloud and crew will investigate a disturbance at the derelict Mako reactor. After killing some mobs and solving some environmental puzzles, Cloud squares off against the Shinra experiment dropped down by Scarlet. 
Then you repeat the entire level again with Tifa in one of the most blatant sections of padding in this game. But it's what happens after Tifa defeats Scarlet's robot that really baffled me. Cloud rushes into the action to rescue Tifa from Scarlet. After slaughtering a whole unit of Sienra soldiers, Homeboy has a brain fart. He gets convinced by a Sephiroth fever dream that Tifa is not the real Tifa, so he attacks her and knocks her into the Mako pool. This never happens in the original game. And then this happens. Ladies and gentlemen, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has officially jumped the shark. This is some of the worst writing I've ever seen. How Tifa manages to survive getting eaten by a weapon, surviving inside its materia belly in a pool of liquid with no way to breathe is beyond me, dude. Then they insert the life stream memory sequence, which usually doesn't happen until much, much later in the game under completely different circumstances. So I wonder how that plot line is gonna change in part three as well. And after all this, Tifa just gets coughed up by the whale and proceeds on as if nothing happened. Why would she continue to trust Cloud after he literally tried to kill her? She never even addresses it. Cloud is the only one who mentions it at all. I can't, dude. I just can't. After the complete shit show that was Gone Gaga, the game does get better in the next few chapters. Cosmo Canyon was really good. Nibbleheim was also relatively close to the original, except with more padding, including a fourth boss fight with Roche. This dude gets more screen time than some of the characters in the original game. Oh, and you also end up fighting Vincent, which again, never happened before. The gold saucer date scene in particular was really well done, and I also really liked the Temple of the Ancients. Although it did start to drag on at the end when they added like 30 minutes of dream sequences into the mix, I was relieved when Cloud finally told Aerith to shut up. Not even him. Are you finished? Clock's ticking. Come on. But then we get to the ending of the game, which, much like Final Fantasy VII Remake, has been an incredible source of controversy and debate. Last week, I put out a video breaking down the ending of Rebirth scene by scene. I don't want to rehash the entire thing here, so I'll put a link in the description if you want to delve deeper on the ending. At the end of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, we are finally confronted with this whole multiverse business. We explore three competing timelines, one in which the world is completely doomed to Sephiroth's meteor and Zack is still alive. One which follows the plot of the original game, and another that follows the current timeline of FF7 Rebirth. Basically, when Cloud and crew defeated the Whisper King at the end of Final Fantasy VII Remake, they fractured space-time and paved the way for multiple worlds. Sephiroth's ultimate goal is to merge those worlds together into a singular universe where he can achieve his ultimate goal of smashing a meteor into the planet and harvesting the resulting energy to become a god. One of the big questions on all of our minds as we played through the game is what would happen to Aerith? She was killed by Sephiroth in the original, but now that the writers have committed to changing the plot, would they keep her alive this time instead? Kind of. Basically, when Sephiroth drops down to kill Aerith, Cloud parries his attack and saves Aerith's life. Yet, we also get glimpses of Aerith's death, and since the game is frequently shifting back and forth between these different worlds or timelines, it ends up being open to interpretation whether Aerith actually survives or not. My initial takeaway was that she did survive, she leaves the Forgotten Capital with the whole group, and takes part in the final scene of the game with Cloud. But Cloud is the only one who interacts with her directly. It's like the other characters don't notice her at all. Also, she doesn't come along with our group for the rest of the journey, opting to return to the Forgotten Capital to continue praying, which is a strange decision. Finally, Cloud makes a promise to her to stop Sephiroth, but then the game ends with no promises await at Journey's End. And this is one of the most frustrating things about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and the remakes as a whole. The writers are trying to straddle the line of changing the story while pretending to preserve it. There are tons of examples of this. They want to save Aerith, but also kill her off. 
or we fight a snake boss, but then lose in a cutscene, only for Sephiroth to come out of nowhere and impale it on a tree, because that's what happens in the original. Or Wedge survives the Sector 7 attack, only to get thrown out a window by Whispers at the end of the game. His death was confirmed during side content in Rebirth, by the way. Or Barret gets killed by Sephiroth, only to be revived moments later by Whispers. All of this reads like bad fanfiction written by a hack who didn't want to see beloved characters die in their favorite story. My view is, if you're gonna change the story, then just commit to it. Make Aerith and Zack alive again and just roll with it. But if you're gonna preserve the original, then stick to the source material. The writers are trying to do both, and it's not really working out, in my opinion. At this point, I've already come to terms with the fact that I'll never get the faithful reimagining of my favorite childhood game. If I'm still making YouTube videos in a few years, I'll probably play part 3 as well and make another critique. I'm in too deep at this point. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is not a masterpiece. Neither was Final Fantasy VII Remake. The gameplay is tedious, the combat falls far short of other games in the genre, the story premise was doomed from the start, and the game is packed to the brim with garbage content. I'm so glad I'm done playing this game so I can spend some time playing something I actually enjoy, like Helldivers 2. If you liked this video, be sure to subscribe to Big Dan Gaming for more RPG videos and reviews. Big shout out to all the channel members for supporting my content. Until next time, this has been Big Dan. I should go.